However, uh, we are in the scope of the surgeon. We can do it without future. See here, uh, coronary stenosis, enlargement, recess stenosis, enlargement. So after surgery, this patient has no leg pain anymore. So we can avoid future surgery. We can be beyond the gold standard. This is a take home message uh, for endoscopic ventral fasciotomy. I think the clinical result is okay. However, if there is a slippage or instability, uh, it's not a good result. So I recommend fusion surgery rather than the decompression only. Uh, final talk is about uh, central stenosis. Uh, it was very difficult to do it uh, using transparent, but uh, I developed and developed my technique. And finally, uh, I did it in 2019. Uh, we, I named uh, lumbar undercut laminectomy. See, this is the uh, total SAB rejection and lumbar undercut laminectomy of the L4 and remove the thick ligament flavor. I can show you one example. She is a 72 years old female, both leg pain and weakness, central stenosis. And this is every four level stenosis. However, she showed a foot drop. So this means how the equina syndrome. But she has a severe pulmonary dysfunction. No more general anesthesia can be done. So I perform under local anesthesia. See, this is a SAP total rejection and undercutting laminectomy here and here. So uh, I could not remove completely the ligament film, but a part of so the uh, spinal canal is enlarged. Then uh, pain disappeared. Also, uh, palsy also improved within three months. This is the final view of undercutting and nectomy and also after removal of the ligament flavor. You see, there, there are nice beating of the dura mater. After lumbar undercutting and laminectomy, everybody is thinking that the disability occurs. However, please look at this. Nice coverage of the facet form because we do not touch this uh, inferior articular process. So I do not ex ex uh, I do not have any instability after surgery. And this is the final case, and 86 years old female both leg pain and weakness. She could not walk for four years. Severe pulmonary dysfunction. She hit here. She is having a home oxygen therapy for one year. No general anesthesia by anesthesiologist and pulmonary logist. MRI shows severe, severe uh, narrow canal narrowing, also uh, grade two spondylolisthesis and muscle weakness. But the problem is the pain. So even in the house, she had pain. So it's very difficult to stand and walk. What's the plan? We are central stenosis with stable symptoms. Cardiac syndrome, no general anesthesia. Okay, transplant and the number and the I think Marco maybe is doing the fusion. But I select this article. Here, SAP, remove IAP, shading, C, fit, here. So this is a big uh, problem. The time lab was here, and I took it, and Dura Mater is there. 
This is before and after surgery, CT scan. I cut it, remove it, the SAB and under the and the cutting the me. I plan and I did it. This is under after surgery here. Interestingly, both leg pain disappear by left side decompression. And this is the final take-home message. Funenoscopic lab under cutting is uh, a central stenosis for AIDS population with poor general anesthesia. Uh, general conditions. Thank you so much. I presented the uh, decompression surgery for uh, rubber fungal phalangidosis. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Koichi Sairo. An excellent talk. Okay. Please stay with us. We'll have some few questions regarding this talk. So first one from me. So you did all this in local anesthesia, right? So what about the patient compliance? Are they comfortable lying in prone position for a duration of half an hour, one hour? So is there any issues or reduced sedation to the patient during the surgery? Yeah, thank you so much. We actually, uh, uh, actually under a little bit sedation, that's a strong one. Just, uh, if, I, if I say something, uh, the patient can answer. So a little bit of sedation and the surgery is maximum, maximum is uh, 90 minutes, 90 minutes. So yeah, uh, usually possible. So can we do it in spinal epidural also? If... No, 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 just uh, really the yeah, lidocaine, 1% no. lidocaine, 15 ml only. Okay, any questions from the audience? Uh, may I ask a question? Dear Koichi, sure, pleasure sure. to hear you, sir. Okay. And I hope we can meet soon someday. Excellent presentation. And uh, you have really pushed the envelope. Where of the syndrome is characterized by an, ab an abnormal enlargement of the transverse. Hello, just hold one minute, please. Okay, okay. So, Archie, what I really like to appreciate is that you really pushed the envelope for transforaminal work, and your uh, talk today has been amazing. Especially the last part of your talk, where you are doing a complete fistectomy, partial heavy right. laminectomy for stenosis, and uh, uh, you are, I think, augmenting that with Calif as a procedure for stability. So, that is a fantastic presentation. We really appreciate your talk today. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you so much. But I'm happy to hear that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sepoji. So, so can we have the next talk of Dr. Sepoddin Hussain from Indonesia, Endoscopic Approach for Butter Lotus Syndrome. Dr. Sepoddin, are you with us? Sweet. Uh, syndrome is characterized by an abnormal enlargement of... Mm -hmm. Bartholati syndrome is characterized by an abnormal enlargement of the transverse process of the most caudal lumbar vertebra. Most of the time, it is asymptomatic, but when it is symptomatic, it is associated with low back pain, radiating leg pain, or both. On plain radiograph, Castel P et al. classified this abnormal enlargement of this transverse process and its relationship with the sacrum or ileum. The overall incidence of Bertoletti syndrome is 4.6 percent of all population. Mechanical low back pain associated with these transitional segments. Little is known about the pathophysiology and mechanic of these vertebral segments and their propensity to be pain generators. The nature of link between lumbar sacral transitional vertebra, low back pain and this degeneration has remained uncertain. It has been claimed that the disc above the transitional vertebra is subject to increased stress 
which renders the vertebral motion segment hypermobile and prone to early degeneration. There is no agreement how to treat these such patients. There are options to treat this syndrome such as physical therapy, steroid injection, radiofrequency ablation, and regenerative treatment such as prolotherapy and platelet-rich plasma, and surgical intervention. In our center last year, we treated three cases of Bertolotti syndrome with endoscopic surgery, and feasibility and techniques and outcome were reviewed, all cases with low back pain and leg pain. All cases outcome were excellent. All patients were evaluated using visual analog score and osmetry disability index questionnaire. Before doing the surgery, we did pain intervention for diagnostic and therapeutic purposes. All of the cases revealed good pain relief, but only last two months. I would like to demonstrate unilateral bipartal endoscopy for treatment of Bertolitis syndrome. Under fluoroscopy, two portals were made for viewing and walking portal over the pseudo joint in between 2.5 centimeter distance. And soft tissue clearance and triangulation were made using standard manner and checked with a CR. Tissue clearance were carried out using radio frequency ablator and to identify the false joint. Bony procedure started using the burr to clear the joint. Next step is to excise the false joint using burr and kerosene and ronger. The final step is to clear the exiting nerve root and checking for the decompression. Thank you very much for your kind attention.
Excellent demonstration, Dr. Saipodian, about Bortillote syndrome. If there are any questions from the audience regarding the talk, anybody? Yeah, there's a question from the audience. Just be with us, Dr. Saipodian. Uh, sir, can you tell us uh, uh, this diagnosis is only by doing uh, contrast study or you can diagnose this on MRI also? Uh, uh, basically, I do the uh, uh, using the standard plane radiography, you can see the Bartholity syndrome. I think the MRI I need just to exclude there is no other pathology, uh, other uh, compression of the nerve. So <clears throat> if isolated Bartholity syndrome, so I assume the pain coming from the Bartholity itself. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, with this talk, we'll end the session. I would invite Dr. Sameh Hassan and Dr. Winter, if they are to moderate the next session. Are they around? Dr. Sameh Hassan, Dr. Sean Winter. Welcome. Yeah. You're moderating this session. Yeah. Can we have the first talk for Mr. Yashiko Nishimara from Japan, full endoscopic lumbar interbody pit. Please take over. Thank you, you've been a wonderful moderator. Um, our next talk is gonna be the full endoscopic interbody fusion by Dr. Nishimura. Uh, is it a, a live or a link? A virtual talk. Can we have the talk, please? Hello, good day to all surgeons, all doctors, and the medic. Excellent. Huh? Staff, I'm Dr. Henry Dimaano from the Philippines. Uh, thank you very much to uh, Endoscopic Spine Foundation India. And thank you very much, uh, Professor Peston, for inviting me to. Uh, give a sharing for this uh, very prestigious occasion. My presentation is uh, on uh, UBE spine surgery uh, as being a disruptive technology uh, applied to third world uh, setting. Uh, if you practice in a first world country, particularly in a developed or a highly urbanized city or town or province, uh, if you sorry, this is. Practice in a tertiary medical facility, whether it's government or private. If you have all the equipment you need for doing UBE surgery, uh, if your hospital welcomes uh, endoscopic spine surgery in any form, if your OR staff is already trained for doing minimally invasive surgery, especially endoscopic spine surgery, if you prefer practicing in a high-end uh, hospital, uh, if your patients already have uh, either coverage or have their own money to spend, and if you still prefer using implants or prefer doing fusion surgery, uh, this presentation of mine might not be actually you know, up your alley. However, if you want to bring high-end technology such as UBE surgery to the masses, uh, if you enjoy using or applying your skills in underserved settings in underserved communities, if you like the challenge of making innovations uh, mm -hmm. out of necessity, if your medical facility can only give you bare minimum uh, of equipment, of support, 
if you love or if you don't mind teaching or sharing your knowledge to the rest of the medical community, if you don't mind practicing in less than ideal settings, if your patients are the kind of patients that still need to come up with funding, with money to, in, in order to get treated, but have trouble doing so, and if you're open-minded, viable alternatives to uh, giving options of treatment for your patients, then I believe this uh, particular talk of mine will probably be something that uh, you might find interesting if not outright inspired. A word on disruptive innovation so that you know where I'm coming from. Uh, the term was actually coined by Professor Clayton Christensen. Disruptive technology is nothing actually new but rather old technology that already exists and is put together or is used uh, in settings that you would not have thought that they would find use in. The big hospitals, the big uh, centers, the specialty areas are at the center, usually not just geographically, but uh, academically, uh, economically. They're at the center of, of uh, the practice. But the rest of the population is out here. So if, if we look at it from that, that perspective, you have the center part and the periphery part where the rest of the population will, of course, rely on trickle-down technology. Disruptive technology as it is changes a product or changes a, a technology from something that is complicated and expensive into something that is affordable and simple. He also said that uh, as far as healthcare goes, rather than expecting healthcare to become affordable or expecting the healthcare providers to offer cheap services or cheap technology, he said that we need to bring out the technology to the lower cost areas, lower cost facilities, so that lower cost caregivers can actually use it. Okay, uh, note about the Philippines, we are located here in Southeast Asia. We have uh, over 100 million people right now. We've had four COVID-19 surges since 2020, and we are currently in an economic recession. Uh, the system is such that in private centers, whether big or small, the patient uh, basically shoulders a huge amount of the healthcare bill. Okay. In government centers, the, the cost of care is paid by the government and field health. But in big government hospitals, there are so many patients, usually patients who cannot afford to go private. Now, what about the smaller government hospital or district hospital, as, sometimes, as they're sometimes called? These are usually really at the peripheries of, of the cities or towns or provinces. Most of them offer only the basic specialties. The bill is footed by our government system, by the local government, national government, and field health. And doctors, as usual, are paid the salary, although not as big as in the big government centers. The situation is about the same. You have few doctors and a lot of patients, but most of these patients, or majority, I would say, more than half, will most likely get referred to the center of your, of your practice, of this hub. Let's go to endoscopic spine surgery in particular. Can we do it in a big private hospital center? Yes. Can we do it in a big government or a uh, big government hospital uh, or medical center? Definitely, yes. Uh, do we have it? Very few big uh, hospitals actually have this service right now in the Philippines. Or for those that do have them, a lot do not uh, make it. Uh, fully aware to the public that they offer this kind of service. How about small private hospitals? Uh, definitely, yes. I actually work out of a small private hospital. The hospital I, I work out of is Federal Mundo Medical Center. It's, a, it's in a major city, but uh, amongst other smaller hospitals. Uh, why am I advocating bringing bipartal endoscopic spine surgery to a district hospital, the small government hospital. In, especially in the provinces, uh, as you go farther and farther away from the main cities, you find less and less hospitals to go to. So definitely you, you have a lot of uh, un underserved uh, people, patients in these areas. The patients can uh, easily afford care in, in a charity hospital, in a government hospital, because as I said, the government basically puts the bill. Okay, you can basically decongest the big government hospitals if you offer the services in small government hospitals. So patients do not always need to go here where, where you have the big, uh, big centers if they have somewhere to go near, near them in the periphery, in the farther areas of the province. A lot of patients normally get offered fusion surgery, instrumented uh, spine surgeries in the big centers. But imagine if you can offer 
uh, UBE surgery that doesn't require fusion, doesn't require implants. Uh, if they ever need fusion, you can always do fusion later. But you know, if, if the main presentation is that they have urologic compression, we can treat them now because we can offer them treatment that is affordable, that they don't have to put effort into in terms of finding funds or in terms of traveling to whichever center offers the technology. A lot of our neighbors are already using this, have already been using endoscopic spine surgery, both biportal and uniportal. So how come very few people practice it in our country? Few reasons that I can think of it, uh, subspecialists are far and few. Most of them are concentrated in the big cities and they are not willing to travel to far-flung areas of the country because that's where they got trained. You know, that's where the technology that they know exists. So they basically follow the technology, they follow the hospital and they will find any other place to be too far. Uh, secondly, no trained personnel. If you go to a, a hospital you know, in the far-flung areas, it's hard to find people who have seen surgery like this or know how to assist in it or how to uh, uh, handle equipment, handle patients or prepare patients. Some will find endoscopic surgery being too difficult to learn or even too difficult to teach. Definitely, there are equipment that you need for doing endoscopic spine surgery. And these are expensive equipment and not all hospitals can afford uh, to have this kind of equipment. In the Philippines, there is no differentiation or distinction between uh, open spine surgery versus any, kind, any other kind of technique. The insurance system will pay you the same way whether you do it full open, classic approach, we'll see approach, uh, using a tubular retractor, using an endoscope, you know, it's all the same. Because of this, uh, some surgeons, I guess, are turned off by the fact that uh, there's no added compensation for, for the higher level of skill involved in endoscopic spine thing. Uh, a lot of surgeons here, I guess, have been trained to use implants, especially in the, on, the, on the orthopedic side. We love our implants. For most patients who do not have any kind of instability at all of, the, of their spine, why would you need implants? You're already doing the most minimally invasive surgery possible. The spine doesn't become unstable. Therefore, there really is no need to put any implants in most of these patients. So the foreseen drop in, in usage of the implants becomes an issue. Uh, because the implants, of course, are sold privately to the patients. Patients normally shoulder the cost of, of pedicle screws and rods and, and interbody cages and fusion material. So hospital administrators tend to say that, well, endoscopic spine is experimental. They think it's so new or that it hasn't been tested yet. So uh, again, it's, it's mostly awareness, I guess, that, what, that, that prevents it from being adopted. Uh, there's still that perception that, okay, it has limited application that you can only use it for doing certain types of decompression and that there is most likely going to be a low return of interest, especially for a private hospital setting. This is a, a view through a tubular retractor system using a microscope. It's, it's an open surgery you're viewing through air. This is a mini open approach. It's actually my surgery. It's the one on the right. I've, I've done a single level uh, fusion, a T-lift here using this incision. The sizes, of course, are, are uh, different. This is smaller than this. But the approach is basically the same. The, the feel is the same. The appearance of the anatomic structures are practically the same. And uh, so we're, we're so used to seeing our target with, with, the, with, with our eyes. And we, we like to directly see where we're going. And it's so different from uh, this view, the endoscopic view, where you cannot directly see what it is you're manipulating and that you're relying primarily on the endoscope camera view in order to do your thing. Okay, some obstacles that uh, we encountered, of course, when we brought the technology to uh, a remote area, an underserved area. Okay, we had the C arm. We were lucky enough that our our provincial governor bought the hospital a C arm fluoroscope. What we did not have was an endoscope tower. We did not have this when we started. Okay, we had no. We still have no radio frequency ablator machine. Nor do we have any kind of arthroscopic burr or neurosurgical burr or drill. Okay, just to share you the scope that I'm using. We don't have an endoscope tower, but this camera over here can link up to a regular laptop by a USB port, which we can also link up to a large screen. 
the drill system is something that I bought out of a hardware. It's a rotary uh, drill type, which I built a foot switch into so that I could trigger it with my foot. And it actually fits a surgical burr. A standard surgical burr will, can be accommodated. So that drill is what you're seeing here, powering the, the round burr. It's not as fast, but uh, it works. It, it does the job. Another adaptation would be to take a, an arthroscopic uh, burr bit or arthroscopic tip, put it, modify it, put it into a hand drill, and basically use the hand drill as your, your, uh, your, your power source. This is basically that arthroscopic uh, tip being used for uh, ULBD. And uh, again, it's not as fast as a high-speed power unit, but it, it basically rotates. It powers the burr. So you can definitely take bone with it. Cautery, we, had no, we still have no radio frequency ablator machine, but uh, a regular bipolar surgery probe used for open surgery can be modified in such a way that it will deliver your cauterization when you need it inside the spine. So you're seeing that here. So you see you have bleeding over here. And there you see the cautery tip works. If you have bone bleeds, well, one, one since, since we're, we're so used to using RF ablators, but you can just stamp down the bone bead with a curette or with a kerosene. You know, just push it down, you know, plug the hole. This is a uniportal uh, bipolar set, a long one. I, I've modified some of them to become shorter and therefore more compatible with doing biportal endoscopic work. You can see that here, it basically works. Works the same way, okay? This is a lumbar disc herniation, a big one, which I am going to uh, slowly expose using uh, this modified bipolar cautery tip, which came from a uniportal set. So it works, again, it works the same way. Uh, just made it shorter so that it's more comfortable to hold. There you go, that's your herniated disc. And these are the instruments that I was showing you. Uh, modified bipolar probes, the burrs, the burr tips that will fit a drill. And uh, I would like to think of uh, being able to bring all my equipment, put it all in a suitcase. That's what, that's what I basically do. I can travel to any hospital that has an operating room that works, and I can basically do the surgery in the hospital where I go. Okay, so this is basically our setup. Okay, this is a burning using the Dremel tool, Garrison forceps. This is the cautery, the modified cautery tip that I'm using here. And as you can see, I'm using a laptop and a big screen to do the discectomy. It's a lumbar discectomy. And there you go. It's basically the same discectomy that you do with high-tech equipment. Same uh, UBE surgery. That's your. This is the kind of UBE surgery that I've done in my my small private hospital. CT scan showing the opening. Patient is uh, walking better after surgery. This is the surgery that we do in the government small government hospital. So we basically get the same results. The major difference between my small private hospital and my small government hospital is that the small private hospital has an endoscopic power. The government hospital doesn't have an endoscopic power, so I'm reliant on my laptop. But other than that, the surgery is the same. So we have successfully brought the uh, unilateral biportal endoscopic spine surgery from being something that you'd only expect to see in a big city, high-tech, high-end private hospital, or government hospital for that matter. And we brought it all the way out to the small level one district hospital small government hospital in the periphery of the province okay where we service a lot of patients who are uh, financially incapable of evading private hospital service uh, where you know being a government hospital we don't have to worry about return of investment or profit margins because the government hospitals don't charge the patients anyway uh, the government hospital is being paid by local government and by national government uh, in, the, in these cases, we have uh, basically found a way to work around some of the main obstacles regarding equipment and expertise. Okay, a few pitfalls that we, we know. Okay, of course, we have to train the staff. Okay, you may need to improvise. Again, as uh, Professor uh, Clayton Christensen said, 
it starts out unsophisticated, relatively low end, low tech, and you can progress uh, as you go along. Okay, you need to go out of your comfort zone. Uh, so if you're if you've just learned endoscopic spine surgery or UBE spine surgery, you may find it very inconvenient if you suddenly go out of the periphery, go out of the underserved areas where again you you would be forced to work with uh, uh, less than ideal conditions. In a, in a monetary sense, we don't expect much profit from doing this, from bringing it out. The, the real goal is to be able to share the technology, be able to bring out the technology so that other people here in the periphery uh, can avail of the service and not have to go all the way to the big city or not have to look for so much money in order to afford the services being offered by big city hospitals. Expect some resistance. Definitely the status quo will not uh, uh, readily accept. So expect to get flat from that side. Uh, when I started doing this, they, they said, you know, are you sure you're going to do it here? I mean, no one's ever done it here. And we don't have the equipment for that or we don't have the expertise or, we, you know, we can't do anything that complex or, or so they think initially. But if you think about it, if you plan for it well enough, you can show them that, sure, you can do it here. And that's what we did. Okay. So basically, we want to bring it here because our goal is to serve the underserved, uh, especially the, the people who would not be able to afford big technology or big hospitals. Uh, we are aiming for patients who need the, the bare minimum who need decompression. Maybe they need fusion too, or maybe they'll need fusion in the future, but let's not worry about that now. Let's just concentrate on delivering the basic service. Okay, so the idea is uh, when working in less than ideal situations, you have to work smarter. You have to think of how you're going to approach the problem and how you're going to find solutions for it. Uh, I actually first heard the concept of disruptive technology from my, my main mentor, Dr. Ramon Bustillo, a uh, well-known orthopedic surgeon. Uh, he said innovation is a natural thing in our practice and expect new technology, new innovations to be disruptive. Uh, but the thing he, he told me before I started my private practice was everything else will come later. Just do a good job. Okay, if you think about it, all these people coming from all the way from Dr. Campion, Dr. Hijikata, going all the way to our uh, American, European, and uh, South Korean friends, and of course, all of you endoscopists in India and uh, in other places in Europe. If you think about it, what we're doing or what they, they're doing now is mainstream, but once upon a time, they were disruptive innovators too. This technology, this technology was disruptive when it first came out. So having uh, shared that with you, I'd, I'd just like to thank uh, Dr. Chol Wong Park and uh, all the rest of the staff of Dejan Wuri Hospital in South Korea. Uh, thank you for teaching me uh, the bulk of this stuff that I, I learned from you. Uh, a note of inspiration to people who are just starting. Doing endoscopic spine surgery may seem, at first seem like this, a straightforward approach, but it's actually a very convoluted journey to get to where you're going. Expect a lot of obstacles, a lot of challenges, but it's natural, it's okay. The point is, you know, uh, this is a necessary technology. We need this. We need this to serve people better and uh, to quote a uh, character out of the Star Trek mythology, uh, as Sarek said, what is necessary is never unwise. So with that, I hope I've inspired you and uh, shown you that uh, such things can be done. And uh, good luck to everyone. And thank you again for inviting me for this talk. Uh, have a good day for the rest of India and all the participants of the convention. Thank you very much. Dr. Henry, that was truly inspirational. And uh, I think that everyone that's attending this Congress is, is aspiring to become disruptors. And uh, you've just shown how wonderful you can actually be innovative in, in that man man manner. Um, our next talk is from Turkey, Dr. Sentuk, on endoscopic approach to different spinal pathologies. Can we have a talk response? Morning. 
so much in my career to create image. Today, I will talk about some key approach to transparent ontologies. Mostly, we perform the surgery on the local anesthesia. The skin mm -hmm. is in the zero millimeters. You may see less soft tissue injury, personal mental injury, and uh, minimal postoperative. You may see minimal postoperative pain, and we also just uh, use the bump mm -hmm. into after surgery. Low risk of peripheral scarring and decreased theatrogenic instability. We may discharge patient the same days and we may analyze the patients uh, second hours. We get a lot of advantages of this surgery. What are the disadvantages of endoscopic spine surgery? And is most important thing for us excessive radiation exposure to all staff in operation room. The surgeons, patients, nurses, the other staff. It is important for us. And a long educational period. Which kind of pathologies we may choose endoscopically? We may choose all types of pathologies and spinal stenosis endoscopically. There are well, another uh, indications we may choose this perfusion endoscopic approaches, and this list will increase day by day. And today we may choose infection, first fracture, smooth malposition, odontoid pathologies, and vertebral fractures, native spinal metastasis, intradural tumors. These days we may choose all these pathologies, and this list will increase in the future, I believe. That. I will show you my experience about these advanced cases. These cases, uh, the, the, the cement leakage, I published these cases four years ago. And here there was a cement lake, and uh, uh, I used translaminar approach for removing this lake. I follow the, the cement on X-ray. Yeah, you can see an view of the cement part. I removed all the cement. Here is part, and our eyes into the spinal canal. We may change all around. Is there any compression or not? Is there any pathology or not? You can check all around, and you can see that there is a a little part of uh, the neck here. and we discharge patients same days. Another part, cement leakage with screw malpositions. It is a option for us. If you get a this type pathology, you can solve these pathologies perfectly with perfect endoscopic approach. Here is cement leakage. There is and uh, we use another translaminar approach. We follow the, uh, and the, the type of the shaver, there is a cement lake part, and there is a uh, screw part, and that part, the screw and cement pushing the nerve tissue. And now we are removing all the pathology part of screw and Mm. And post-operative CT scan, you may see we removed all part of uh, pathologies. Another uh, pathology is vertebral fracture. In vertebral endoscopic approach is an mm. option uh, for this type of pathology. Mm. It is a simple for us uh, in this case. Patients get a back pain and the left leg pain. You may see the case. Another translaminar approach. There is a, a nerve root, and we are the same thing nerve. And here is a bone, fractured bone. We use a shaver for removal of this part of bone. And here we use protecting burr. And this, this bone, is uh, 
pushing the nerve tissue, be it dissected the nerve tissue after we remove this bone. Under endoscopic view, we perform vertebroplasty. The cement part is coming to our side, and we push the over uh, this the cement part to the uh, top of the vertebra, anterior part of the vertebra. We restrate all the uh, vertebra here, and we are checking around if there is any compression or not to the nerve tissue and, and post-operative CT scan and possible uh, scoliography and we discharge these patients another day without any instrument, instrument. And spinal metastasis it is uh, another option, another endoscopic option for this type of pathologies. You may see this case. Uh, patients get a severe left leg pain. For this type of pathologies, you have to uh, embolize the tumor if you get a uh, hypervascular spine metastasis. We embolize the tumor after we perform this surgery. Here is tumor tissue. If you embolize the tumor, you can perform this surgery easily, like this surgery. We dissect the tissue after we coagulize the tumor and we remove the tumor tissue. Mm -hmm. Here is the tumor. Like this surgery. And we finish the surgery postoperative MRI. We discharge these patients postoperative. Second day, just one pain killer. It was uh, important for this type patient. Another case, it is the first case in the literature we performed the surgery four years ago, intraglial tumor. Uh, we used the translaminar approach to target point. Uh, before surgery, we described everything in our head and we opened the window on the lamina and uh, we check X-ray. The location is clear. You know, to the tumor under this dura. We <coughs> open the dura here after we. Yes, for clear vision, we remove the bone part of dura, and here is tumor now. Yes, tumor, and we dissected the tura and the tumor from the nerve tissue after we removed the old tumor. And during the surgery and the camera, your our eyes into the dura, we can see everything. <coughs> Is there any tumor tissue? We are checking around and we removed all tumor. We are checking around. For closing technique, we use a uh, draw match and the T cell. There are a lot of techniques for closing the dura. And possibility of MRI, it is clear. And the window on the lamina and possibility third year MRI, everything is clear. <coughs> And I know, I believe that this indication list will increase day by day. Thank you so much for inviting me this great meeting. I'm so happy. These are all the uh, publications we published and uh, a lot of techniques. Thank you so much from sample. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Sintuk. Our next speaker, speaker yeah. is also a virtual talk, uh, Dr. Schubert, and it's on the evolution in endoscopic spine surgery. Mm -hmm.
Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear Malcolm, especially to you, many thanks for this nice and warm, warm invitation in these times. It is very hard to organize a meeting. You do it always perfectly from my point of view. Yes, the consequent evolution in endoscopic spine surgery, endoscopic spine surgery is not equal endoscopic spine surgery. It is something even spine surgeons, if they published papers about endoscopic procedures, they do forget and they do not describe how they perform endoscopic spine surgery. I will give you a presentation of a transformer spine surgery performed with a new system called Septovation. It's created by my own. The conventional microscopic dorsal lumbar open discectomy is still worldwide the gold standard treatment for lumbar symptomatic disc herniations. Let's change the standard treatment for lumbar symptomatic disc herniation stenosis and further pathologies. Here you see an overview of my personal experience, for example, endoscopic presbyterian discectomy since 2002, I did more than 10,000. In the past, I did more the microscopic discectomies and laminectomies, and now my main focus is in endoscopic spine. What are the excess indication? Mainly for transferminal procedures, it is a disc herniation, back pain, painful disc, foraminal stenosis, removal of leakage, bones for cement, for, for example, or cage implantation. I see the indication for an interlaminar approach. For example, if you want to treat facet joints or a central stenosis. What, are, what is the different philosophy? And, Again, I will show you that endoscopic spine surgery is not equal endoscopic spine surgery. First, we have the inside out or outside in technique. What does it mean? Inside means inside the disc. That means, for example, with a yes from Tony Young, Young endoscopic spine system or vertebrate system, the philosophy is first to go into the disc and then maybe. With a decompression, you remove the disc herniation and you can treat the nerve. I have a different philosophy. My philosophy is outside in. That means I keep outside the disc in the spinal channel first to treat and to remove, for example, disc herniation and see the freed nerve. Additionally, if I want, if I think there are loose material inside the disc, I can remove it. And then we have an interlaminar approach or a far lateral or posterior lateral approach. There are a little bit differences on the instrument and approach. And nevertheless, we have to make, um, we have to divide between a full endoscopic or X ray control axis to the spinal channel. Transmenar and interlaminar. Again, it's a philosophy, if you like, the inside-out technique or the outside-in technique. If you like it, full endoscopic or particular X-ray control approach, you can do it interlaminar or transforminal. For example, you can perform it in general anesthesia or what I, ne I never do it because I do it in anal sedation and maybe that's the reason that I never had one nerve damage in 10,000 cases. 
you can uh, perform it in the, the, the patient is uh, positioned in prone position or in a lateral position. But nevertheless, for all these approaches, you will need a reamer or drill. You should uh, remove much as necessary and less as possible outside in or inside out technique. And you should always uh, make a fluoroscopic control of your forceps. Here is some publication of, of me and mine and my partners in the, in the past. Here again, my personal philosophy, what are the advantages and disadvantages. So the interlaminar approach gives you, from my point of view, more disadvantages than advantages. You have to resection, for example, ligament flavum, you have to take uh, bone from the lamina, uh, you have a risk of instability, you have more bleeding problems. If you have a uh, cauda leakage, you, have, you will give you a problem, et cetera, et cetera, like that. And what are the manufacturing systems for the microdiscectomy? You will find a lot of instruments, manufacturers, but nevertheless, there is a yes or vegetable system where they are more performing the inside out technique. And then the test system with Thomas Hopland, he was the inaugurator of this technique. And then later on, uh, he, he developed the Maxmore, and I developed the septivation powered by MET2B instruments. And in what is something very important, what are the limitations of the transformer endoscopic procedure? For me, there are the limitations of dorsal or posterior sequestral discaniation. You can't reach it and transforminal very good or central stenosis, large cyst or intradural tumors, but interlamina is still possible. Example. Here you see just a normal disc herniation L5 S1 to the left side. And here I will bring in the MRI to the, the X ray control, and you will see that the positioning of my forceps are exactly at the right spot. Here it's a neuroforaminal stenosis. In the reason what I explained already is that you have lima or drills, you can nicely perform uh, foraminal to me. What you see here is an intra-discaniation. And that here, that's the Bandscheibenvorfall. Open procedure. You just and then you do not have yet. to ream. You yeah. just go there. It is a, this procedure, for example, I needed less than 10 minutes to be there to remove this discaniation. And in that time, a colleague from from the Netherlands, he was with me, and I removed the discrimination. It was a very big one. Now you can see it. I removed everything in total. Okay. Here, we'll be... Sorry. Here we have an extra terminal discrimination at 5S1. It's also an easy case. Again, the control of my forceps. Here, for example, the control after three months, the pre-operative and the post-operative pictures. So you can see that the uh, external discrepant was nicely removed. In the upper picture, you see the free nerve root and on the right side and on the right side, the lower picture, you see the removed disc material. Here you see a very seldom posterior sequestrate disc herniation for that like I explained in the beginning, um, you can't do a transforminal for that, you need an interlaminar approach. And again, here is the control of my forceps. Perfect. Next picture shows you high iliac crest. So I did, did perform also um, the transforminal approach. It is very easy. I did not have to go trans iliacal. Here you see a Cranial sequestrated disc herniation at level 3, 4. And here uh, at those are cysts at level L5, S1. And also here, I the control of the forceps, perfect. And here on these pictures, you see first I removed mechanically the cyst, and then I used additionally the laser. Here, another example of a cranial sequestrated disc herniation L5, S1. 
the approach is a little bit different. It's not that far lateral. Also here, I did not perform a transiliacal approach and trans I used the transforminal approach. Again here, nice control of pictures. Again, the approach seven centimeters on the lateral. Yeah, of the lateral of the joint. And here, caudal, far caudal sequestrated disc herniation at four five. Also here, nice removing. Yes, perfect. And here you see a congenital or a, um, spondylistasis. The patient who was a colleague with uh, around seventy years old. It never gave him a, a problem, slight back problems, and now he suffered of mainly leg pain. Leg leg pain and all the colleagues wanted to fuse him and I just removed the disc herniation, the extra formula disc herniation and now he's happy. Yes, you see the pictures. It was a little bit tricky because you see the disc herniation is sticked between the transversing and exiting nerve root. For that I used a high, a higher approach to level 5 S1 and I used the bandit forceps. And here another another presentation of um, a pre-operated patient with a laminar defect, a lot of scar tissue for the endoscopic procedure was very nice. And nevertheless, um, disc herniation at level TH9, 10, and here you see the uh, six, five, six, and here the no, right, nine, ten. Sorry, the marking, and then the approach is just six centimeter. And you do not have to go on that far media for reason of the dual damage. So note almost all operations performed in lateral position of the patient, all operations performed under analgo sedation or and no general anesthesia. That means the transformal endoscopic spine surgery is an effective and safe procedure without significant complications and may help to avoid major operations or open microdiscectomies independent of size or location of the herniated disc from stenosis, as well in our center, the gold standard treatment. Take home, due to the very different endoscopic surgical techniques, like I have explained in the beginning, explicit reference should be made in the future for the technique used in all the studies. I would like to thank the auditorium again for this nice invitation. It was in with cooperation with Septovation and the Apex Spine Center, the new system for cervical, thoracic, and lumbar spine. Thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Schubert. Uh, seems like I'm going to have to change my flights so that I uh, travel via Germany to come and see the Septovation myself. Uh, it gives me the honor to ask Dr. Anand Kavi to moderate the next section. Okay, so we proceed with the next session and now we start the virtual talk by Dr. Mehmet Zileli on philosophy of minimally invasive spine surgery from Turkey. Yes, uh, this talk uh, will uh, be dealing with philosophy of minimally invasive spine surgery. Uh, this is my conclusion, right? Uh, it has significant advantages, but it has also some disadvantages like long learning curve, need for special instruments and equipment, and the loss of tactile sensation, complications, hard to treat, and uh, safety measures, and more radiation to surgeon and surgical team. Uh, what is how that the indications are same with conventional surgery, Outcomes are same, 
of more radiation. Uh, there are mainly three types of uh, MIS surgeries. One is the image guided pancreas. The other one is the endoscopic and mini open surgeries. Uh, probably the vertebral body support using vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty by cement augmentation is the most uh, less in invasive, least invasive surgical approach for spinal situations. This presentation will uh, summarize those points, MIST confessions, MIS fusions, MIS deformity corrections, and confessions. The compression can be done mainly by, by tube-sided surgery or full endoscopy. Uh, actually, Cupidus surgery has been introduced in 1996 by Foley and Smith. Uh, it is by inserting a key wire and then uh, some dilatation tubes and then placing a tube over uh, the, the, by dilating the muscles uh, to the target uh, and using an endoscope or microscope at the end. There are uh, different tubes in the market. Metrix, EasyGo, and the standard systems are the pioneers of those tubes. With a tube by the surgery, you can uh, angulate your tube in different directions, and uh, you can uh, make from same incision two level disc decompressions, or with urethral approach, bilateral decompression or lumbar spine stenosis. Ku uh, and Fessler's uh, mm -hmm. publication in 2002 uh, has been the pioneer of that. Then uh, the, the system has been adopted as of course spinal canal stenosis by using high speed drill and control decompression by a unit approach has been possible. It can also be adapted to parallel lumbar disc herniation, and also cervical microendoscopic discectomy uh, or postural foraminotomy can be done um, with the help of a tube. This is a case of mine, the 71 disc herniation and lateral recess stenosis. Uh, these are some steps of surgery. This is the uh, central dura. This is the root and this is the uh, hernia part. You can uh, just uh, incise the disc and then remove the three fragments. There is also <coughs> full endoscopy or so-called uh, water irrigating systems. It was first introduced by Dr. Kambin. Uh, a transformer approach for these carnations. And then uh, more recently, Rutan has adopted the system for interlaminar endoscopy. Actually, transformer endoscopy can have restricted indications. L5S1 is difficult, uh, and it is more uh, proper for intraporaminar or extraporaminar <coughs> carnations. <coughs> However, interlaminar endoscopy. Uh, can be more appropriate for most of the disc herniations, intracanal extruded disc herniation, and L5S1 is easy. If you compare the, the, uh, the systems, this is a very diff different system using water irrigation system. <coughs> the uh, diameter is about seven millimeters. Here, diameter is about 14 to 16 millimeters or larger. This is the uh, Rutan's uh, depictions of uh, the surgery. Actually, uh, you can also adapt uh, some high speed drills to that system. Uh, but these advantages are stenosis training is harder. There is a steep learning curve 
the baseline issues are expensive. Uh, and in conclusion, two kind of discectomy may be applied in all forms of financial and spinal stenosis. And it needs no, more modification of conventional issues. Baseline for the are next cheap. learning and time is shorter. Mm -hmm. And uh, no, yeah, transformative in the uh, water irrigated in local systems are more technically demanding and have restricted usage. And you can get more complications, especially injury to the dura and root uh, may happen, uh, especially mm -hmm. in the learning time. What about MIS fusions? First of all, a medical screw fixation can be done by uh, MIS techniques. Uh, if you look at the uh, opening with uh, in normal uh, surgery, this is what happens uh, with retractors. There is a significant amount of muscle damage. However, MIS medical insertion, you can uh, place them through the muscles so then the, the muscles are mostly uh, protected uh, you must learn uh, radiologic anatomy very well especially ap uh, fluoroscopy is uh, radio radiology is very important and uh, ct navigation can be used or uh, if it is floor only, a period can be used. Uh, most surgeons prefer a cannulated screw. So first place key wire, then uh, place a cannulated screw onto the key wire. But placing the rod may be more difficult. Uh, Kevin and Foley has also uh, developed a technique for that the so-called sextant system, uh, and uh, it was adapted for short segments, but uh, it can be also used in longer segments with some modifications. MIS pedicle screw fixation has advantages with smaller incisions, less muscle retraction and trauma, less blood loss, reduced postal pain, and shorter hospital stays. However, potentially longer operation times, longer learning curve, and technically demanding, loss of, loss of surgeon control, tactile feeling, and uh, especially placing the roads may be quite difficult, and more radiation for surgeons is uh, the main disadvantage. What about T lift, A lift, and X lift? Uh, actually, you know all these techniques. This is for interbody fusion. Uh, Tilt may be done by a pyramidal muscle splitting approach with a large tubular retractor. Uh, a unilateral or bilateral approach may be used. Uh, and uh, more recently, uh, Dr. Pimenta has introduced uh, extreme lateral interbody fusion. We must better call it a transpsoatic approach. Uh, but uh, in this technique, uh, lumbar sacral plexus can be injured, and EMG monitoring of uh, lumbar plexus is necessary, especially retractors, because it is a long tube uh, we must place there. Uh, special cages are necessary. Indications for uh, lesions from L1 to L45, L5S1 is not possible. Uh, and uh, you can also make an indirect compression of spine stenosis. Even some deformed deformation is possible with this technique. But these advantages are injured to the lumbar circumference, need of EMG monitoring, working channel, and posture fixation still necessary. There are also other practical fixation like Transfacet fixation, translaminar facet fixation. Confirm uh, uh, chart uh, No, we on the uh, one uh, And the, the camera set kar The so-called axial lift system, transsectal approach for alpha test level, <coughs> has been introduced uh, not to 
too far away from today, but uh, uh, placing a graph inside the disk uh, is not possible, is, is not very uh, robust, uh, and additional fixation points are necessary. Otherwise, non-union may happen. Since it needs additional posture fixation, high non-union rate, and reported major complications of bowel penetration exactly, it was left by most sources. What about MIS deformity correction? There are different techniques, thoracoscopic releases, thoracoscopic instrumentation, uh, thoracoscopic releases uh, similar to thoracoscopic discectomy, releasing and bone grafting. Disadvantage addition of a postural surgery is still necessary. Currently, anterior releases have been replaced by postural techniques, so <laughs> there is not much need of doing that uh, with a thoracoscopic technique. Uh, what about thoracoscopic instrumentation? It is possible, but disadvantages of higher sonatros and implant failure, technically demanding and mostly abandoned. In conclusion, we must uh, stress the infection rates with MIS surgeries. This is a, a report from 2009 uh, with one more than 1,300 surgeries, and they reported that tenfold less infection than open surgeries. If you look at the disadvantages, Open surgery may have more possibility of pain, longer hospital stay, cosmetic bad, and tissue scar. So, MIS surgeries have some advantages over those items. Uh, but uh, patient demands control our techniques, and uh, deep learning curve and learning time is a big concern. As I said before, Disadvantages of long learning curve, need of special instruments and equipment, complications hard to treat, more radiation to surgeon and team, and outcomes are similar to traditional surgery, are disadvantages of MIS surgeries. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was a very nice overview of minimally invasive spine surgery. Now we have the next talk by Dr. Boris Pavlov from Ukraine. And uh, after that, we have uh, Dr. Brodinsky from Poland. I think both of them are online. So we'll proceed with Dr. Pavlov's talk. Yeah. Could we? yeah. So uh, just be online. So your, your talk is next one. Okay. okay, so now we are starting with Dr. Paolo. Dear colleagues, I'm glad to welcome you. I represent the Neurospine <laughs> Clinic from Kiev, Ukraine. The main areas of our professional activity are orthopedic, spinal neurosurgery, and interventional pain management. And today, I would like to acquaint you our experience in the treatment of uh, lumbar sacral radicular pain. There is no conflict of interest in this work with flavored drugs and product using. Uh, a bit of history. I think. DFT first device of for radio frequency destruction uh, by Cosman, uh, father and son. 1974, uh, radio frequency is used to treat of pain. 1981, introduction of special cameras, uh, expense indications for radio frequency, and 1998, beginning of uh, pulsed radio frequency. The general scheme of radio frequency action is as follows. The active electrode is located paraneurally 
The passive electrode is located on the skin above the large muscle mass. And uh, for example, uh, in the gluteal region or in the scapula region, after connecting the radio frequency generator uh, around the tip of active electrode, an electromagnetic field arises, which has, uh, depending on the specified parameters, a ther therapeutic effect. On the right side of the slide, you can see radio frequency generator set of cannulas, active electrode, and the passive electrode. The therapeutic field around the tip active electrode is approximately 11 millimeter in diameter. It's necessary uh, to distinguish between two fundamental types of uh, radio frequency exposure, which can be said by the generator. This is constant type or uh, of impact and pulse type of impact. The results of first is uh, coagulating necrosis. The result of the second is a change in electrical uh, conductivity properties of tissue. <coughs> The pulse type of exposure was proposed in the mid 90s by Cosmo. Uh, the generator produced burst pulses, burst of pulses, at frequency of uh, 500 uh, kilohertz, with a duration of uh, 20 milliseconds, and at interval of uh, 480 milliseconds. Large intervals do not allow the tissue to hit up about uh, 40, 42 degrees Celsius. In this aspect, the work of Erdin et al. published uh, in 2009 is of great interest. According to the received data, uh, the intrinsic ultrastructural components of axons have been found to show microscopic damage after exposure of uh, exposed to pure uh, including membranes in mitochondrial morphology and disruption disorganization of uh, microfilaments, microtubules. Damage uh, is more pronounced for C fibers than for A delta and A beta fibers. Thus, the therapeutic radio frequency effect is distributed primarily to block the conduction of pain impulses. Motor and sensory fibers remain practically impact. A few words about epidemiology. Prevalence of the lower back pain in developed countries has the side of pandemic serious, not only medical, but in social economic problems as well. In the USA and countries of Western Hello? Europe, the prevalence of lower back pain is uh, 40, 80 persons and the annual incidence by persons. It's the second most common after respiratory disease. The reason for going to the doctor and the third by the frequency of hospitalization. From different categories of love and pain, they will focus on the uh, specific uh, discogenic and uh, radicular uh, since they often coexist. The connection of lumbar pain with uh, intervertebral disc irritation was established by a huge label in 1948. Uh, uh, later, the data were refined by Nikolai Bogdub. During the this generation, not only uh, the diminution of nerve fibers in the central section of the disc is observed, but also the increase in the density of uh, innervation. In the nerve fibers of the disc in the spinal nodes, immunoreactivity to substance P was found.
Hello. Can you hear me right now? <laughs> 